Hi, colleagues. Um, for some reason, we have this uh, GDG Ashabat banner. It's strange. Let me try to remove it. Всем добрый день. У нас тут почему-то баннер GDG Ashabat. Сейчас. Let me figure out how to remove this uh, Ashabat banner. Just a minute. Since uh, I guess Christopher is not here yet anyway. Hi, Christopher. How are you? Hello. Uh, just a few seconds. I, I have some trouble with this background. It's weird, though. OK. It's GG. Since this is uh, uh, Google Developers Group's uh, StreamYard account, and we share it with a couple of other communities, we have Ashkabat on background. But I, I think anyway, it, uh, it won't bother people. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, I think we're uh, ready to start. Let's move on uh, without uh, this. Uh, with this, uh, it's nice anyway. With some mm -hmm. people. Okay. Uh, thank you very much for uh, joining. So uh, let me introduce. Uh, Christopher is a uh, serial entrepreneur. Uh, with a big history of. Uh, uh, exits. Uh, he's a founder of uh, it's a fintech company, uh, which Christopher had a, a nice exit from it, and also a computer company Solo. Uh, at the moment, uh, also having big background in software developing development, Christopher is also an expert in uh, UX UI, and uh, currently running a virtual UX assistant company, Attractive AI. Also, Christopher is mentoring uh, in several leading uh, startup accelerators, like Sampo, Kiwas, I, I might be <laughs> pronouncing wrong. Mm, uh, well, that's good. Uh, regarding our community, Christopher, we thank you for uh, spending time today. Actually, uh, there are, uh, this is joint event of uh, two chapters. Google Developers Group, uh, Nur Sultan. It's around 500 people in our like community. Uh, at least emails we got. Sometimes they show up, sometimes they don't. Uh, and second one, GDG Almaty. It's much bigger and older. It's I think it's more than 1,500 people. Uh, it's uh, in general uh, we have uh, Andrew. He's Almaty uh, and a couple of other guys. Uh, some of them might be online, uh, Mikhail Hremenko and others. And we are uh, curated by Boris. He lives in uh, Istanbul. Uh, he's a nice guy. Maybe you'll meet him uh, someday. Uh, today, uh, we have 6 p.m. in the evening. M many people will uh, join later. Some, most of them will join this in record and YouTube channel. It will be there probably forever. If you don't, mind, if you might, we can uh, delete it or just cut something. Uh, and we had a uh, few uh, questions from community. Uh, I sent you via email in advance. Not sure whether you had time to read them, but I can repeat in the chat later uh, these questions on UX. And thank you very much. Uh, People might be writing some uh, questions or might not. I will be voicing them anyway. Uh, I guess we have uh, up to one hour uh, time. If you wish, we could extend it, but uh, it's up to you. Thank you very much. I will uh, allow you to uh, take out the microphone. 
Okay, th thank you. Um, so uh, I, uh, um, I I'm, this is the first time I've I've used uh, Streamyard. So forgive me if there's uh, if there's any things that I'm I'm missing here. And of course, it would be interesting. I don't know. Uh, do you know how many people there are sort of listening or or watching? Is that something that I can see? Uh, it says six people are uh, watching. Okay. Let me see. Seven now join someone. Uh, two people from Facebook. Uh, others uh, watch on YouTube. And oh, I Correct. see the names. It's Diana. It's Michael from Almaty chapter. He says it's Boris. Uh, is watching as well, and the guy is called Almat Kurmashov. He is probably the UX guy. Uh, hi all, hi Boris, Michael, Diana, Almat, and others are unidentified. Seven people so far. Okay, so maybe they can ask questions as well, or or uh, comments uh, on at least the chat thing. Okay, I see that Diana okay. at least has has commented. Uh, so um, yeah. So uh, thank you everybody for for joining. And uh, uh, this is um, uh, the way I, I plan to do this was is basically to mostly talk about uh, UX and what is UX and some of the some of the most common problems that I've seen and that the industry has seen and the, what to consider whenever you're designing a, a great application. So what I'll do is I will share a screen and uh, we will hopefully be able to have some thoughts on that. Let me see if I can find it. Just give me one minute. There we go. Share. Okay, so you should be able to see the screen now and I'll go into full screen. Uh, hopefully that, that works for you guys. So um, just a very brief about what uh, Attractive is. Uh, uh, as mentioned, it, it is a bot that can analyze UX, so we can interact with websites and they give you pointers and tips and issues that your site might have and how to, how to improve them. And it does it in a very human-like way, so it actually interacts uh, with the service. And uh, you can actually go and there's a free version of it, so you can go and test on online um, at attractive.ai. Uh, you just give it the website address, and then it does some uh, a few very simple analysis for free. And then if you want more, of course, then there's uh, various subscription packages. And so this is kind of the format that we would give. So it would, can find design issues and, and inconsistencies and so forth. And uh, happy to ask any questions or, or answer any questions about that, sorry. Uh, but that's not really my topic here. I want to talk about why UX is, um, is important and uh, why we're doing this thing. So um, let me just give up, get out my notes. So uh, one of the key reasons why- Sorry, Christopher. Uh, yeah. I apologize. Uh, just in case, could you please uh, uh, push the button share screen? Uh, I want to check whether people see it. Uh, okay, like I'm not. I'm, I stopped the share. No, ah, you I'm stopped the share. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, it was fine then before. I apologize. Okay. Just okay. double checking. Yeah. If you could and just. Then, uh, then I will. I will get it back and so you I'm should now see region. a screen with uh, uh, a sad face and yeah with uh, yeah. yeah so um, so what I wanted to uh, talk about here is that uh, is the importance of, of UX and um, the I mean everybody probably knows this already but the one of the key uh, key things about the online experience is that that over 90% of, of people, if they come up with a site that they don't like, they will leave. So people today are extremely impatient when it comes to online experience. They don't want to learn new things. They don't want to spend uh, time on that. And um, this translates into 
uh, significant losses of, of money. This is a McKinsey study that 40% of all product profits are lost due to uh, bad product experience. So th this, is a, this is a massive amount of money. And uh, you can see the success stories. So the companies who have really put effort into great user experience, you can look at the apples and I would argue Amazon back in the day in particular, um, Airbnb, uh, Uber to some degree, um, these are companies that have become successful because they offer just a great overall experience. And we've probably forgotten most of the companies that don't offer that. But it's, it's, it's of course, very difficult to kind of, it's, it's a very human-led process. It's very labor uh, to, to get a grip for that. But let's look at some of the kind of key things that you can think about. Another way to look at this is that over a trillion dollars is lost in e-commerce. This is in only in, in America. So globally, this will be much bigger still. Um, so of course, in e-commerce, it's particularly important to get that great experience. And it's not just about conversion, it's also about getting people to come back and to share the site and so forth. And then the final pointer is that Google now has made this a priority for them. So they're working on their new search algorithm. Uh, this will come out next year. And the UX will play a much larger role in uh, search results than ever before. So even Google uh, is looking at this. And of course, this is going to change the whole face of the, the internet. So it's very important to start thinking about these things right now. So uh, some of the kind of the basic rules of, of good UX, um, and uh, this one I love, it's like, don't, don't assume anything so don't the word uh, intuitive is actually almost a forbidden wor word i mean we use it in daily language of course but from a ux and user interface design point of view intuitive doesn't mean anything um, everything that we do in our computers and in our life is learned i think somebody analyzed this and the only thing that's like truly intuitive is if you see um, a mother's teat and you want to grab it. Um, so everything else is, is, is kind of learned. And this is a scene from Star Trek IV, uh, a movie back in the 1980s, where the, the crew of the Star Trek Enterprise, they get thrown back in time, of course, to the 1980s. And Scotty here, the engineer, is trying to use the computer. Now, in the Star Trek future, the way they interact with computers is by talking to them. So he comes, he sees this ancient computer and he can't, it's not reacting to his voice. And it's like, oh, okay, there's this device that I must talk to, uh, uh, to interact with it, which is actually, of course, the mouse. So, so we have to learn things. Um, I had a similar story as well when I was teaching uh, this is at a local kind of uh, council, and we were teaching some um, older ladies how to use the internet. And um, at some point, I, I said that, okay, to, to go back, you just move your mouse to the back button and click it. And one of the ladies would literally pick up the physical mouse and move it on top of the, of the back button and just couldn't understand why that didn't work. And of course we laugh, but I mean, that's, it's, she has never done this sort of thing before. And so it just goes to show that even something like a mouse is not intuitive at all. Uh, this is a really classic uh, kind of um, model that uh, everybody should, should look at. It's called the Fitz Law. It's actually quite simplistic. It's, it's made to sound more cool than it actually is. But it's basically about how important targets and how they should be larger um, than targets which are less uh, relevant, less, less important. And this can actually manifest in surprising ways. So the menu bar of the Macintosh, which actually can, you can see in, in, in this screenshot, is at the top of the screen on the Macintosh. And the reason for that, so whereas on Windows and on other 
other uh, platforms, the menu is often on the in the window itself, and you would think that that's quicker because it's a shorter distance to the menu. But um, placing it on the top of the screen makes it effectively an infinitely high target. And the corners in particularly are interesting because they're infinitely large in all dimensions. <coughs> Sorry. So, so hitting those targets means that it's actually faster and easier to hit those targets because you can just swipe your mouse uh, as you know, you can make a big movement and it will hit the top of the screen rather than trying to aim at a particular smaller menu target. And this is something that then you can think about in your own user interface is how to make those important targets if you're doing mobile, having them close to where your thumbs would normally be, for instance. Um, I, I, I like to, to talk about UX as being very much like a, like a martial art and um, how you manipulate things and, and uh, the psychology behind, behind it. And one of one, one fascinating uh, uh, study is that uh, user interfaces are basically they they're grammatically they are uh, noun or object verb. So uh, you first take the target, you first select the object that you want to manipulate, and then you manipulate that target. And uh, this is this is an example that how you would do it, and everybody knows how to do this. It, like this is just it has become the common practice. So you select the text that you want to manipulate, and then you delete it, or you make it larger, or you bold it, or whatever it is that you want to do with that particular text. Now, the interesting thing is that this was not actually always the case. So um, there were other user interfaces where uh, you had to select the mode of the text first, or the, the operation first, and then select the target. So, uh, so that was that. That's that's quite kind of curious. That something that we now take for granted was not actually always a, the case. Mm, to continue on that kind of martial arts theme, um, it, there is this concept called direct manipulation, which, uh, when it's done right, again, you 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 don't even think about it. It's only when it's broken that you suddenly start to notice it. So direct manipulation, you can see it very much in kind of woosy -woog, um document editors, for instance, or in painting tools, where you change the color of, of, of some object and you can see the results immediately. So you're kind of moving these sliders and it will change the color of the object directly. Rather than having to go to some different document or window adjusting some things and then pressing OK and then going back. You, so you'd like to be able to manipulate things directly in front of you. And uh, a good example of this, which many, many websites, by the way, break, is if you have a profile or preference settings page, then uh, there's many pages that you go to your profile and then you have to press a separate button to edit the profile, which kind of actually doesn't make any sense. Uh, it's effectively showing exactly the same information on the edit page uh, than on the view page. So the better way is to just allow it to be able to click on the profile things and then kind of the profile updates. So again, that direct, direct manipulation, which is also connected to the next theme, which is um, what is called modality. And a good user interface should not have many modes of operation. So while computers are great at remembering which mode they are in, humans are very, very bad at this. And it can, it's distracting, they lose a sense of what they are doing. And this is an example from the editor uh, VI or Vim as, uh, is the moder more modern version of that. Uh, which, by the way, I know many developers love, but I absolutely, I, I, I hate this <laughs> editor. And um, so, of course, those who are familiar with it know that there's the edit mode, uh, especially in the old VI version, there's the edit mode, uh, where you can kind of, or rather input mode, 
where you can input text, and then there's the command mode where you can kind of enter commands and manip manipulate that. And uh, this is just considered uh, extremely bad practice. So this is something that you absolutely should avoid in, in all of your user interfaces. Um, and by the way, if you're thinking that um, a key shortcut is, is also just basically a mode because you're pressing, say, the command key or the control key, then that's not actually the case. So studies have shown that whenever you're pressing a key, that is a, because you're kind of physically interacting with something, that is a mode that the brain processes very naturally, that you're constantly pressing something and then you're uh, hitting the command to execute something. So, so that is perfectly okay, pressing something and then sliding or adjusting or hitting a command. In, in websites, this often ma manifests in various types of uh, pop-ups, uh, pop which is a, a, definitely a pet peeve of mine. And uh, you'll frequently come to a web page and it will pop up to say, hey, enter your email to subscribe to get some offers. Um, or, or, or even worse is, a pop-up that appears and says that uh, give us some feedback uh, of the website. And the worst is, is when this happens uh, immediately. I mean, you have had no chance whatsoever to familiarize yourself with the design of the website, to understand the offering of the product that they have, and you're expected to give some kind of feedback. Well, I mean, that doesn't make any sense. You don't have any feedback to give. So if you do have to have this kind of a pop-up where you're trying to get them to sign to you an, uh, an email list, uh, I mean, if you absolutely insist on that, then the, the best way to do that is to af after they have done something with the website. So maybe they've selected a product or they have added it to their, um, their basket, and then you can prompt prompt them to say, okay, you know what, if you want 15% off this product, you could just uh, sign up to our, our newsletter. That's a very natural thing. And of course, if you want feedback and prompt them after they've completed their purchase, uh, that's the best place to do that. Mm, objects in user interfaces should remain static. So uh, people are, are very good at kind of uh, muscle memory, remembering where where things are uh, once they use it enough times. It's like whenever you're in, entering your PIN code for a, a credit card, often if you have to think about the PIN code, you actually end up forgetting it. But it's so built into our sort of muscle memory that we just type it out without e even thinking. And uh, so don't do what cats like to do, which is to kind of move objects away from where they're supposed to be that gets people really lost. An example of this was, um, I think this was the early 2000s, uh, Microsoft Word had this AI feature. So this goes back to one of the questions where it's like how to use AI as part of optimizing the user experience. And uh, what they did is that they had this uh, learning mechanism that would alter the menus to reflect um, commands and features that the user either commonly used or was deemed useful in the particular context that the user was in. And um, uh, on paper, of course, it sounds like a great idea, like we're, we're showing menus that uh, are commonly used and the user, user needs in that particular situation. But the problem was that is it broke muscle memory. So you go back to a menu and it, the menu structure is different from what it was the previous time. So users are unable to learn kind of the structure of the menu and to be able to interact uh, act with that quickly. So, so that's, a, that's a big, big no-no. Now, uh, there are other ways to approach this. And uh, we've seen Google and Apple uh, do this now where they can, the phones can prompt you if they think that there's something that you might want to do in that particular context. So they don't change the menu structure or any of the user interface elements, but they can suggest things that you might want to do at, the, at that time. And um, those uh, seem to perform um, at least a little bit better. 
And when giving kind of these types of targets, it's it's e extremely powerful to offer as few targets as as possible. So the when the first iPhone came out, it was actually fantastic. I mean, this was a a completely new user interface that nobody had ever used before. The phone looked radically different from anything else out there. There was no keyboard. And how do you get people to interact with that? Well, there was exactly one uh, button. So that was kind of obvious whenever you approach the phone that there's only one thing that you could possibly do with it. So of course, you, that's the one thing that you press. And that's where what then sort of opens up the experience. And um, Google was famous for this as well. Um, and I would argue that this is one of the reasons Google became successful. I mean, people joked about it. They laughed about it at the time that you go to google.com and instead of all these different categories and links and things that were on other search engines, all it had was a single input box and, and that was it. And of course, this is fantastic because it draws people to doing the, the one thing that uh, that they they that Google wants them to do. So again, think about this whenever you're designing your interfaces. At each step in the process, what is the one thing that you want people to do? And of course, you might have other options as well. But what is what is the one key action that you think people uh, should be guided towards? And um, not Nokia is a good counter example uh, of this. I mean, actually, they used to be much much worse but um but the, even today if you go to their website um the kind of the joke is with a lot of corporate websites is that they look like the corporate structure of the of the organization so you get a separate section for every single department where they can promote their thing rather than one overall view on what is the key thing that you want people to do on that site and Apple has been traditionally quite good at that. So if you go to the apple.com website, they will often be showing, okay, this is the latest iPhone. So this is the one thing you want to go and look at. Whereas on the, the Nokia side, there is no, they have their slogan, a bit of text, but there's no key thing that I should do in this, in this uh, situation. Now, of course, Nokia's business is now very different than what it used to be, but still the Nokia brand exists, especially for consumers in, in mobile phones. So if you think about like probably 90% of the people coming to the website are, are people interested in mobile phones, then you know why not kind of showcase that as the key interaction? And actually only if you go, if you scroll further down, you do find that yes, they are, they have some phones that they are selling or uh, technically it's some other company under their brand um, as a call to action. Uh, but equally big is the 5G. And so you can see that, okay, these are the key things that they want to promote. But even here, this is a little bit confusing. They have two call to actions. So you, you could argue for cutting that even further and thinking about what is the number one thing that you want people to do or know about your company. So this is an example then of uh, this was some time back of the of the, uh, the Apple page. Uh, as I mentioned, they do a pretty pretty decent job at this. So they show just one product. It's not as good as it was. Um, in this case, they have like a couple of different options. You're like, okay, which one do I click on? Um, but it's still it's 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 focused on that one product that they want to promote at that particular time. Um, now, speaking of like sort of kind of bringing all of these factors together is the experience that we have with using a uh, computer mouse. Now, of course, many of us are using maybe touch pads these days, uh, but nonetheless, um, the mouse experience is kind of one of our key interactive elements. And um, uh, people kind of make fun of the fact that the old Macintoshes, they only had the one mouse pointer, but there was a very strong justification behind that, again, that they wanted people to, to at least click that one thing and then learn what might happen after they click that.
she would press the one button and then drag to select. On this system, you would either select a word or a character and you would extend it with the, the third button. Uh, in the line bar, that's the line between the scroll bar and the text area, yellow selects a paragraph and blue extends a selection. With the window command, blue creates a new window with a new document. Yellow splits the current window, giving two views of the current document, and red moves the window. However, with the kill command, the red kills the window gives it uh, and gives it space to the window above, blue to the window below, and yellow clears the window but doesn't kill it. And these instructions were completely different for the Laurel uh, messaging program, which I won't go into. So you can actually count there how many of these sort of user interface UX kind of laws uh, this is breaking about modality so you have to think about which mode am i in you're offering multiple targets and and um it, it just gets in, in, incredibly confusing uh, to use a system one of the key things about a great user experience is that you have an undo as well so this is why i i'm not a big fan of diy work i know many people are but I hate it because there's no undo. So if I drill a hole in the wrong place or I cut something wrong, I'm screwed. I have to start all over again. Or I've caused irreparable damage to some uh, structure. Um, and um, and this is why it's it's the undo is so important because- Sorry, Christopher, people, yeah. uh, I see pe people cannot see the screen. Uh, maybe we let's try one more time if you could uh, try to okay. share presentation. Uh, and I'm okay. So now I'm stopping the share. Yeah. And I will sh I will share again. Mm -hmm. So now now you should see the window. Can can you see the window? Uh, I guess they don't see. Mm, it's very strange. Ooh. Okay. I mean, ah, you press share screen, but nothing happens, right? Okay. Uh, I let me see. Ah, I see this. This background, the GDG Ashkabat, it's blocking the screen because I see screen on the background, but I. Okay. It's very strange. Yeah, and the, also the system wasn't really prompting me with chat messages, so then you actually see what people are saying as well. Yes. Maybe I'll try to completely remove this. GDG. Let me, let me try uh, for probably one minute to... Minute. And also, uh, Diana was saying that there is no sound. Yeah. Oh, now should right. be right. good now. Yeah. Okay. We we won. Uh, let let, are, let me actually. Uh, there are plenty of questions. Uh, I, I I probably should approve them here. Uh, I will. Would you like me to uh, show them later? Because there are a few people asking questions in the chat. I don't know if you see them. Anyway, I'm I can going, see some. Uh, yeah. I'm muting myself. Uh, thank you. Sorry for disruption. Now we perfect. No problem. Fine. No, thank you for letting me know. Um, I'll 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 put this into full screen. And can you confirm that you're still seeing this? Yeah, I do. Perfect. Okay. All right. So uh, what I'll do is I'll try to uh, pick up speed a little bit with the rest of the presentation, and then maybe take the questions then at the end, and we can kind of discuss things uh, more freely, if that makes sense. So, uh, so yes, I was talking uh, talking about the undo. Hopefully, people can hear me. Um, uh, I don't see the chat messages now, so uh, let's just uh, interrupt me verbally or something. Um, so, yes, undo is important because you want to be able, uh, have users uh, be able to explore the user interface. 
and the application without without fear of losing data. So that's the worst thing that people worry about is losing stuff. And that's why undo is so, so important. And again, many, many, many web applications do not have undo. It, it's actually quite scary. Um, I'll not go into a lot of depth into this. So what, what you can do is also read about the importance of color and contrast and how that plays into drawing attention to certain areas. So this is the color wheel, and you can read about color theory online. Um, but you can see some examples of kind of how yeah, having the right contrast uh, really helped to stand out. So this is an analysis that we did for one company, where uh, on the left, you can see what they had before, and on the right, after they did adjustments. So we showed that uh, the color contrast were, was quite weak with the original uh, user interface. So I hope you agree that the one on the right uh, definitely draws more attention to, to what they're doing. Uh, this was another one where uh, we felt it was quite poor. So um, it's like sort of correlating colors, blue and green uh, do not stand out very strongly from one another. But if you look at the, the whole the um, uh, front page, then uh, the, the blue and then the kind of the contrasting color, which is sort of orange or red, uh, stands out very, very strongly. But also think about color blindness. So, so you need to, it's not enough just to have color as a way to form contrast, but you also need to use um, the, uh, the shade of the, uh, uh, the brightness of the element to uh, generate contrast as well. And uh, this is another, another fascinating one. So this is one analysis that we did. So we have this uh, heat map that our system can generate without any users. So it kind of looks at it with computer vision. And you can think about what are the areas here that are highlighted. So there's the furniture, there's some of the elements at the top. But if you look at the actual page, under the furniture button or the furniture text, they have this shop now text. And you would imagine that the shop now text is probably the number one thing that you would want people to do on this site. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, it almost completely disappears from this analysis. And um, the next uh, couple of slides are about aesthetics. So um, although engineers don't like to think about aesthetics, but um, aesthetics actually plays a big role in how people experience the site and, and how usable a site is. So there was this very interesting study by Hitachi about uh, cash machines. And they give uh, users two user interfaces, one which was functionally simple, so less options and fewer steps, but ugly. And then they give other users a user interface which was beautiful, but more complex. And the one that was more beautiful was not only preferred, but actually considered easier to use, even though technically it was actually more complex. So that's quite fascinating. And uh, if you think about the, some of the key things about aesthetics that you can even approach, even as a non-designer, you can think about the symmetry, uh, the symmetry of the page. So both top, top to bottom, left to right, uh, or an application that it has a nice graded out layout. So things are evenly spaced that helps uh, manifest that sort of aesthetics. Uh, that you have the right type of uh, colors to use that you highlight things. And also that you don't try to pack too many things of different shapes and sizes in the same user interface. So one counter example of this is eBay, which of course is hugely successful because it was probably the first at the time. But I mean, the, the, the user interface for that is quite, quite a nightmare. It's very often. In the EU, you may or may not be aware of this, but in the EU, if you're designing a site that uh, ha is um, an essential service, so say a bank or an insurance or a go government agency or, or, or education, it has to be accessible. So you have to think about disabilities. And actually 15% of all, of all of the global population has some form of disability whether it's like dyslexia or just that they're elderly, they might have learning disabilities. So if you're not considering those or disabilities, you're actually losing a huge part of the market. I'll go through these super quick, maybe. These are some of the top five that 
that we've done in our, our own ana analysis. These are not necessarily the most serious, but the most common that appear. So um, low resolution images are, are just poor image quality. And uh, this is frustratingly common still today that you have buttons that open up into new uh, open up new windows, uh, which is should really be avoided, uh, especially if you're just linking within the site, and especially in this example where the other ones act differently. So again, have a consistent user interface. Uh, various types of contrast coloring issues are very very common, and. Uh, then uh, not considering social media tags. Um, I can go into technical details about, about how to do that later, but uh, those are good for sharing. And then of course the good old alt text. So uh, people people drop the alt text or not putting it for images, which is really important, not just for people with disabilities, but also for search engines. So they will rank these types of sites lower. So do consider that. Uh, I'll not go into these. These are some other serious observations that we had. Here are a few things that you can uh, you can read um, for background information. The Nielsen Norman Group has many many articles about different types of problems that you can analyze. This is especially for websites. I I really love the book by Jeff Raskin, also the Human Interface. He was the designer of the Macintosh, and um, so he or the creator of the Macintosh rather. And uh, so he goes into a lot of detail about the decisions that they made and also how user interfaces could kind of de uh, develop in the future. I mean, this was written in the 90s or something like that. But uh, um, it's, it's a really great book. So just to recap, uh, don't assume anything because that about your users, about how they might approach it because that old lady there might be a homicidal murderer don't give multiple targets uh, to hit. So try to focus on giving a clear single single target to work with. So this is a counter example. So this is a good, good clear single target and make sure that it's directly manipulatable. So you can uh, manipulate it directly. Make important targets big enough so that they're easy to hit. But don't forget about aesthetics. It's very important for the overall user experience. And at the end of the day, allow people to you know, forgive and forget, so provide them with the undo so they can get back and uh, be friends, and, and be friends as well with them. So that's what I had to talk about in, in this presentation. And of course, there's lots of details and other stuff to talk about as well, but we're going to run out of time if I if I go into that too much. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher. We got a bunch of pre-prepared mm -hmm. questions, which uh, let me put them on the screen. Yeah. This first one is uh, from uh, Isulu. Is she works in a direct IT company. She says, uh, mm -hmm. AI in the UX industry, how can we eliminate human errors during usability analysis? Yeah. So I wasn't sure if this is this question was about uh, user testing or just AI in general. But um, the the one benefit of actually using AI and automated systems is that they, in theory, don't have any bias. So they are very objective in their approach. And um, so from that point of view, I think it's, it's useful to look at some of the tools to help with at least some of the basics. And Go uh, Google Lighthouse is, is one example, which is built into Chrome and it's completely for free. So you can get some, some feedback on the one view that you have in front of you. And um, there's uh, also Site Improve, which is, um, I think from Denmark, and uh, they they can look through the site uh, with um, uh, look at sort of broken links and some generic uh, generic stuff. And of course, there's our own tool as well. So um, with that, you can get some things like generated heat maps that are generated about the user interfaces itself uh, without any users and without your own bias. So you can see 
what are the focus areas and it's now i think it's like 90 percent reliable at the moment so it's pretty reliable um 90 percent is a huge number <laughs> yeah uh, so i don't know if that answers uh, this particular question but it answers maybe some questions uh, i think uh, i saw she might write uh, in in comments here and there's another question uh, pros and cons it's a typo here pros and cons of data-driven design how to understand the difference between machine approach and critical thinking this kind of yeah. philosophical question i think this is a super great question and uh, I was I was thinking about this a lot um, because I'm a very intuitive type of person. So I come, even though I have a technical background, I come from a, a family background of, of uh, artists and, and designers. So um, I what what I what I find disturbing at the moment is that so many companies are so purely machine and data driven and um and and that, that i mean that's great up to a point but uh, i find that it's hindering many companies from making those kind of big leaps of faith, uh, faith where you're taking those kind of big bets on 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 something that might turn out to be right uh, over time so uh, I always go back to, uh, I apologize for this, but I go back to the iPhone example. I mean, um, I'm sure Nokia was doing a lot of kind of data-driven sort of design thinking in there. They had lots of users out there, but it, it, to, to, it took that leap of faith on Apple's side from Steve Jobs and from the rest of the team to come to invest heavily into design, which was completely radically different, and I, I don't, I don't think it's possible to do that sort of uh, leap with the data-driven uh, approach. So the way I like to look at it is that data-driven is is okay for optimizing some things, uh, but if you if you're like coming into a market which is, which is really already really crowded, so, and you really want to stand out. You're going to have to do something more than being just uh, merely data driven and uh, so I, in in this sense like i'm also talking against our own tool because i mean our tool is it provides you analysis and sort of feedback on your current design and of course it's great to use that and you and you should use that but to really make those human decisions i think the really great designers and great ux people can make kind of those big intuitive uh, approaches, which I think are, are can be sort of like absolutely in, in differentiating. So unfortunately, I don't like to have a, like a really good sort of one sentence answer to that question, but this is a really, really key uh, balancing act that I'm constantly struggling with, uh, even in our own organization, how to balance that intuition versus the data-driven approach. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh did I yeah, did on. I got it uh, correctly that uh, data driven approach in general, like broadly speaking, is sort of becoming like a commodity in in yeah. near future? Mm. Yeah, it, it it already is. Everybody's doing A B testing and and uh, running analysis and this and that. Everybody's doing that. So there's no way to stand out uh, in any big sense from the crowd if that, that that's all you're doing. So again, it's to optimize the design that you already have, but to be able to really kind of create a difference, then I still think you need kind of that human component. And this this is an organizational uh, challenge as well, because many, many organizations, the designer or the UX person is low down in the hiring chain. So mm. they are they're told to design something according to a spec which I think is exactly the reverse of how things should be done. So you're never going to get those big leaps, that big jump in, in the experience if, if you have that kind of an organizational structure. So designers and UX people should be at the top of the chain 
And then, of course, everybody else is then giving feedback and sort of implementing the thoughts that they have. Mm -hmm. I, I, I see. Thank you very much. This is uh, so it, it means that if you don't use this data driven design, then you're, you're already lagging behind since uh, it's just a necessary prerequisite to use it. Uh, I, next I think question. So. Yeah, and and sorry to interrupt, but uh, like I was in last last one I was in in Silicon Valley. I mean, everybody was doing it. It was like it, it's it's the definitive thing to do. Like it's it's just taken for granted. Everybody does it. So mm -hmm. if you're not doing it, you're you're as you said, you're already lagging behind. Um, but mm -hmm. you have to think of then other ways to differentiate uh, that. And I think a, a big part of that answer is the hiring, the organizational structure. So for instance, in Holvey, our first hire was a designer. So he was sitting there at the top of the kind of product. Um, and only then did we hire some uh, some more of the developers. And uh, we had a similar structure with Solo as well, where designer was actually the first hire that we had. Mm -hmm. I see. Thank you very much. Uh, next question. Could you please tell about your experience in failed UX solutions? Future trends and patterns in the industry. <laughs> it's uh, three questions in one. Um, maybe, uh, uh, maybe the first one is more interesting. This uh, experience in failed UX solutions, since you already covered uh, future trends, patterns in some way during the yeah. keynote. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I approached this question by um, uh, by looking at my actual presentation. So. I think my, I, I hope that the presentation was talking a lot about um, some of the examples in the past of where where things went wrong uh, and uh, and and the future trends. But what what I find also interesting is that uh, UX, so many of the principles of UX have not actually changed that much. So people assume that. You know, design is, is changing all the time, but it, it design is, I mean, aesthetics is changing. What we what we like to see in buttons, what type, are we using neomorphism or skeuomorphism or whatever it is that we're using, that changes. But the kind of the core principles of how a good user interface functions has actually pretty much remained the same. I mean, you could look at studies from the late 80s and the 90s and so forth, and they're 100% applicable uh, today as well. And it's, it, it's, it's, it's simple. I mean, our psychology or the human brain has not changed that much. So I don't, I don't actually think that there are that big trend differences um, there in UX. Um, but maybe the latest one in terms of design is uh, neomorphism. I don't know if I can write that somehow into the mm -hmm. comment chat, but some people are probably already familiar with that. Thank you. And uh, there is a uh, last question which appeared within this uh, keynote uh, speech. How soon do you think I can retrain from graphic designer to UI designer? And what literature would Ooh. you advise to read for this? Graphic designer, what what does it mean? It's probably the designer who develops uh, like stickers for retail, point of sales, that kind yeah. of stuff. Yeah, that's that's a great question, and and I think actually the uh, for uh, Elizabeth, I mean, uh, if you can can combine those, so if you're a great graphic designer. And then you're starting to also understand about the UX. I think that's that's a super powerful position to be. I think some of the smartest, greatest people are those who combine those both. And it actually makes sense because being a great designer is understanding about human psychology and what they like, what they what connects uh, them to to your work. And UX is very much the same. It's just taking a slightly more formal pr approach. So what I would do um, at the very least, uh, so just looking back at this, I hope you can see the screen, uh, yeah. but, but these repos in particular, yeah. 
Stack Exchange, that's more about like a forum and stuff. So maybe I will start with the Nielsen Norman group, uh, I think. And uh, looking at some of those articles is eye-opening. But I really, really recommend um, uh, the human interface. I, I really love that book. It's, it's both a historical sort of artifact, but it, it describes the mentality that you need to design great user interfaces. So yeah, I would go, I would go there. Thank you. Uh, I guess there are uh, no more questions, no more questions. And we are almost uh, ex uh, in time. Uh, Christopher, I wanted to uh, short discussion about the, since this will, uh, will, will be recorded, this is recorded in YouTube, but mm -hmm. uh, first 20 uh, or, tw or 25 minutes, people saw this, <laughs> uh black background uh, i was just thinking maybe what do you think if i will delete the first 20 minutes and if it's possible to somehow share the presentation or do you think it's a bad idea to delete the first part i was just thinking if i were a guy who will watch the record for 20 minutes with well yeah i i, I can hear the narrative voice uh, how to do better to delete I, 20 minutes or not I would argue for not maybe deleting because there's some mm -hmm. points that I point to later on. But what I can yeah. do is I can share, I can send you the the presentation slides. So I don't know if that's somehow possible that you could just kind of embed them into the video. It's 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 quite obvious which slide I'm talking about. I don't mm -hmm. know if that makes Perfect. sense. Okay, and then we will edit uh, video description. We will put make sure people see it uh, on the first line of that for first 20 minutes, please uh, see this uh, deck attached. Great solution. Yeah. Uh, uh, I, no I noticed a comment from uh, Isolo. I don't know if that's pronounced correctly, but that um, in Google's case, their designer left because they got too data centered. And I think that's that that's exactly uh, the that's exactly true, and I I constantly get the feeling that Google as a company, even though they've been hiring designers and they're trying to invest in it, but they're not a design driven company, and it shows in their products. Um, pretty much everything else that they've created, apart from Google.com, is uh, a design nightmare. So most of their products are really confusing and, and in some cases even ugly. And I think it just shows that they're at the heart, at the core of the company. They don't care about this enough. They look at it too much as a sort of mathematics e exercise. So again, I think it's organization that solves that problem. Having those designers at the very top is what leads to a culture of caring about those types of things in the product. Thank you. Uh, I, I remember you, you had this uh, idea uh, of doing, as, 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 uh, like you did in this Nordic trip. Uh, I just want to share the audience. Uh, Christopher had an idea to have a trip in uh, like Central Asia by car. Uh, to chat to professionals, to startups. Uh, we, I don't know, we will try somehow to help with this, but at the moment it's during pandemic, it's a uh, little bit probably not this year <laughs> discussion. Yeah. I, I, uh, if someone of you guys have some ideas, uh, please feel free to, uh, contact uh, Christopher, the contacts are here, uh, or via this uh, Google Developers Group. Uh, thank you very much, Christopher, for your time. And, uh, uh, maybe I can add one one thing as well. So, uh, Askar, you probably know the group better than me, but uh, what, what we can also do is, if you go to attractive.ai website and you want to try the, the uh, advisor level, so that normally costs money. But uh, if they're part of this group, and Oscar, I can probably confirm it with you, 
um, we can we can do an, a, a free analysis for for their uh, website. So mm -hmm. so that and, uh, and the only thing that we ask in return is that we get a feedback uh, call so that we can because we're learning about our own product as well. So if there's any any people here who want to do like a full analysis of their site, then please get in touch and and we'll we'll try to arrange that for free. Mm -hmm. Uh, we can do this uh, on our site easily since uh, we have all the like first name and last name of all our members. We could mm -hmm. somehow filter. If you guys could write to either me or uh, Mikhail Akhrimenko uh, or Andrew, or we could filter this. Uh, we could then write to Christopher and to provide you with this uh, promotion code or how is it called? Some yeah, it's easy. Yeah, uh, be done. and I will put my email on the chat. Uh, I'm not sure if this is because there's a there's the private chat section, and I don't know if uh, all the guests are seeing uh, that or not. Uh, you you need comments section. Uh, ah, let yeah, me, but there, there uh, I, can't, I I can't write anything on the comment section. Yeah. Ah, there you go. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christopher. Uh, let's keep in touch uh, with the group and uh, thank you for your time. Uh, if there will be some other questions, I will probably write you for email, by email. Uh, there are uh, some people who write uh, questions. For instance, I, saw we are, I know Isolu, she is UX analyt analytic in a IT company. And there are actually quite a few UX experts in the group. Uh, I'm sure exactly. it was... Uh, great feeling of international experience and uh, like top of the notch ideas thank you very much for this so so, so you guys probably uh, all uh, knew all about this uh, if you're ux experts then you probably knew about all of this stuff already but uh, hopefully it wasn't uh, too boring thank you very much have a nice day and uh, let's keep in touch take care bye bye bye